Yeah, we, we can uh, start. I would like to introduce our uh, guest, uh, today guest, Professor Shaul Stampfer from Hebrew uh, University. Uh, Professor uh, Stampfer is um, uh, a scholar who is interested in many uh, subjects. I will not main them because uh, Professor asked me not to not to uh, talk a, a lot about him, but uh, I would like to say that the um, uh, topic today's topic is about uh, hazards theory, and Professor will explain what is his uh, attitude toward this whole hazard story. Good evening. <laughs> I am very happy to see all of you here to this evening. And I have to say that this talk is the product of many years of work on the Khazars. How did it start? About 10 years ago, an article was published in an Israeli journal asking, did the Khazars really convert to Judaism? And the article was very interesting, but very poorly written. It was a bad article, even though it was interesting. And since I am at the university, by definition, I am a snob. And I said, how could they publish an article like this? And then somebody said, Shaul, be calm and be quiet. You don't have to quickly say things like that. The man who wrote the article is 93 years old. If you can write an article when you will be 93 years old, you will be very happy. And I realized it's better to learn than to criticize. But the question remained, what about the ideas of the article? And I waited several years to see if somebody would answer the questions of the article. Nobody did. And then I decided that somebody has to do that, and that is my job. And I worked on the topic, and when I was almost finished, I wrote a letter to the author, who was by then older, and I wrote to him that I agreed with his ideas, and I'm very thankful. And he said to me, how boring. It's much more interesting to argue than to agree. And then I realized that he really was a great scholar. So you will hear what I have to say. Now, since it is already the evening, and since people have done things today, and maybe somebody will have to leave early, I will start with the conclusion. <laughs> the question of the lecture is, are the Jews descendants of the Khazars? And the sad news is that they are not. I'm Jewish. I would be very happy to say that my great-great-grandfather was a warrior who rode the horses on the steppes of Asia. But I have to admit the truth. My great-great-grandfather was probably a tailor, and also his son, and also his grandson. The conclusion is not as interesting as how we can decide who are the ancestors from 
a thousand years ago. So, if you want the answer, you have it, and you are free to go home. If you want to know how, you will have to remain a little longer. Now, there are basically two questions. First question is, are the Jews descended from the Khazars? And the second question is, did the Khazar, were the Khazars Jews? They're separate questions. The Jews could be descended from the Khazars, whether or not they were Jewish. So I will go step by step. Now, if most of the Jews today, or the Jews uh, descended from Polish Jews, were Khazars, then we have to ask, what is the evidence? Now, I can tell you very clearly that there is no evidence, no source, that the Jews of Poland were descended from the Khazars. How can I say this? We are at the Museum of Polish Jewish History and Culture. Go to the museum. There is nothing there. If there was real evidence, it would be there. And I would not be here. So there is no real text found in Poland saying that I am a Khazar Jew who came here or a report. However, the idea has spread and for actually an interesting reason. They, until the, the Holocaust or the World War, there were millions of Jews in Poland. They had to come from somewhere. And there are many people who said, where could so many Jews have come from? The number of Jews in Germany and the Czech lands was limited. If they ha came from somewhere, it had to be from somewhere else. Ah, there were many Jews in the Khazar lands, and the Jews of Poland probably are descended of refugees who came to the West. Poland is the West. So that it's not a question of source, but it's a question of a problem. Where did the Polish Jews come from? Yes. And this is the uh, this the the Khazar kingdom disappeared at the end of the 10th century, and it existed for a while before then. We're talking about a thousand years ago, a little more than a thousand years. So, how can we check the claim, even without evidence, that the Jews of Poland are descended from the Khazars? Well, what where were the earliest Jewish settlements that we know about in Poland? The earliest settlements were in Schlesia and Silesia, in Wrocław, in uh, Kraków, in cities basically in the western part of Poland. Now, one can say this does not prove very much, even though logically one would expect the early settlements to be in the east, 
because one could say during the Hmong period of the Mongol uh, attacks that communities moved and disappeared. But there are other sources which are more uh, relevant to our topic. One of them is Yiddish. Yiddish as a language, like every language, is not only a language that people speak, but it is a history book. You can look at the language and learn about the history of the people who speak the language. So, for example, if you go to Israel and you want to learn, do many Jews in Israel come from Polish roots? I'll tell you a simple way to, tech, te to check. Go on a street in Israel and ask people, what is a balagan? <laughs> Everybody knows. And you'll ask them, what kind of a word is balagan? And they will tell you. It's Hebrew. And if you see a rabbi wearing a hat, what hat is he wearing? It's a kapaluch. Where does that come from? Probably from the Talmud. It's an old Hebrew word. But you, when people speak a language that has words, in this case from Polish, that these words reflect the fact that part of the population once spoke Polish, and the words enter the language. In Yiddish, there are many words that come from Old French or Italian, because the first speakers of Yiddish came from Italy up north to Germany and preserved some of the words from the it, from the Romance roots, from Italian or Old French. And then Yiddish spread. But, it, but what happens when we look at Yiddish for Khazar words? We don't know very much about the Khazar language. How do you translate very much? That's what professors use when they don't know anything. They don't like to say they don't know anything, but we don't. We have no written text from the Khazars. But considering the region and the time, it seems to be clear that it was that Khazars were a Turkic people. If the, there were many Khazars who fled to Poland, one would expect to find a significant number of words in Yiddish from Turkish sources. Words for foods, names, these are very conservative. But one does not find it. There are almost no words of Turkish roots in Yiddish. The ones that are came through Polish, not from Turkish directly. So that this makes it very difficult to claim that there were many refugees from the Khazar kingdom who came and to the West. Then one can look in an additional field, and that is the field of prayers. Now, there are different traditions of prayers in the Jewish world. One style of prayer is typical for Ashkenazim, and that is for Germany, France, 
and Eastern Europe, Poland, Ukraine. And there is another tradition of prayers, which is typical for Turkey, Greece, and Egypt. What people sometimes say, the Sephardic tradition, but it's not from Spain, it's from the Orient. Now, if the Khazars converted to Judaism, who converted it then? Because the land of the Khazars is near the Black Sea, the, so that whoever converted them would have been rabbis from Byzantium, which means that they would have had the Oriental tradition of prayers. But if you look in the prayers of Polish Jews, there is nothing of this. It does come in, but only very recently, and because of Hasidism. But historically, there is no echo of uh, Eastern Oriental prayers and traditions. In the Oriental world, Jews had more than one wife, two wives, three wives. You don't have that in Poland at all, for good reasons. Finally, there is another way to examine the background of the Jews, and that is the genetics of the Jews. What happens if we examine the DNA and check relationships? Now, I'm not a great believer yet in all of the details of genetic research, but it is serious. And research generally has found that the DNA of Polish Jews is quite similar to the DNA of Jews in Western Europe, also in Morocco and Iraq. There is one more group that is close from the view of DNA to Polish Jews, Palestinians. So maybe there is hope for some kind of peaceful relationships. But there is no element of the DNA of Polish Jews which seems to have any relationship to the DNA common in the Turkic peoples. Not just Turkey, but also in what's now uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, various areas where there are related populations. There is Nothing that similar. Now, I once wrote a paper on this topic, and just as I was ready to publish it, an article appeared in a journal of genetics published by Oxford University Press. Now, Oxford is a very serious university. And the author of the article found that the DNA of the Jews was very similar to what he thought was the DNA of the Khazars. Now, I did not like this article. Why? It was against my thesis. But if he has evidence, it's evidence. But I decided to read the article carefully. And I read it very carefully, more carefully than the editors at Oxford University. Now, when one reads an article on genetics, 
and involves comparing the DNA of Jews or of any population with another population, there is one extremely important fact that you have to look for. In the language of statistics, it's called N. What is N? Number. How many people did the author check? I read the article, and I didn't remember the number. I read it a few more times. I couldn't find the number. But he said he based this on a data bank at a university in Tartu, in Estonia. But since I am a very serious scholar, I wrote a letter to the university in Tartu, and I asked for the information. They could not have been nicer. Thanks to God, we have email. And in two days, I had the data. How many people did he check? Eight. Now, when you check eight people, it's a little difficult to come to a statistical conclusion. And it was very clear why the author did not write down the size of the sample. Now, there was a second problem. Where do you find Hazars today? I would be very happy to sit down with a Khazar and have a conversation over a cup of coffee. But we don't know who they are. We don't even know their language. We do not know where they went. Interesting problems, but I will not deal with them. But what did he do? Well, he said, I need data on the Khazars. The Khazars were far away near the Black Sea. Now, Georgia, or Gruzia, is also far away. And in Gruzia, Georgia, they have good data on DNA. So, since they lived near each other, probably the DNA was very similar. So, I'll take the data for Gruzia. I will compare it with my eight Jews, and we will see what we can find. Now, anybody who has been to Georgia which is apparently a beautiful place, and very brave people. They'd, some of their neighbors are not so nice, but it's a fascinating population, knows that the Georgians speak Georgian, they are Christians, and they are absolutely not Turks. That is not a Turkish population. But... That did not bother this person, and that did not bother Oxford University Press. Both of them wanted one thing. They wanted a sensation. They wanted genetic proof that Ashkenazi Jews are descended from the Khazars. Now, you can... There's nothing to say more about this type of an argument. The fact that the, this article proves nothing doesn't answer our questions, but the fact that Yiddish has no Khazar element, 
the fact that the religious traditions have no Khazar element, the fact that the Jewish names have no Turkish tradition, they all argue against the identification of Polish Jewry with Khazars. And now we get to the most significant point, and that is, were the Khazars ever Jews? Now, there is a lot of evidence that the Khazars were Jews. Many sources state this fact, but it is difficult to believe every story. There are many fantastic stories. In Jewish tradition, there was a river in the area of Khazaria called Sambation. And six days a week, the river flowed and was violent. But on the Sabbath, this was a religious river, on the Sabbath, the river rested and it was quiet. It's a nice story. People went to actually look for the river that rested on the Sabbath, but there is no river that rested on the Sabbath. And there are stories about creatures with the body of the horse and a head of a man. Nobody found them. We did find creatures with the body of a man and the head of a pig. And if you go into politics, you will find many creatures like this. But the body of the horse and the head of a man does not exist. So we have a story about the Khazars becoming Jewish. This has to be examined. Now, basically, without looking yet at the sources, it does not make sense. The Khazars, this we do know, were a very powerful, very violent, warlike people. They were between the Russians and the Arabs in the south. And Islam expanded from the Arabian Peninsula, from Saudi Arabia, Mecca and Medina, expanded through Palestine up to Iraq, and Islam moved to the north until it met the Khazars. The Khazars basically were the force that stopped the spread of Islam to the north. If it was not for the Khazars, the Russian or Rus would have probably become Muslim. As a result, the Arabs hated the Khazars for very good reason. The wars were brutal and difficult. So that there's no question that they were a powerful and important people. Now, what do we know about Judaism? So, trust me, I know a little bit about it. Elements of Judaism that we are familiar with are the laws of kosher food, the laws of the Sabbath, of holidays, all kinds of laws in life. Why would a normal person, a Khazar warrior, 
want to start observing the Sabbath? Why would he want to start looking for a kosher restaurant? There are restrictions on sexual activity. Why would he need all of these restrictions on his behavior? It doesn't make sense. However, many things happen that don't make sense. So we have to check. But we have to be, at the same time, critical. So what then are the sources that we have? I'll start with some of the sources, and then I will start with the sources that we don't have. We have a letter written by the king of the Khazars. That's a very good source. The king of the Khazars writes a letter to a Jew in Spain, and he writes that my great-great-great-grandfather, ten generations back, had a dream that God was not happy with him, and he had this dream over and over, and he started to worship God, but God was not happy again, and he decided that he would find the true faith. So he invited representatives of the Jews, of the Christians, and of the Muslims, and they had a debate, and he couldn't figure out which person was right. But then he saw that the Christians honored the Jews, and the Muslims honored the Jews, so being democratic, he decided the Jews are probably correct, and he became Jewish. And he built synagogues, and he built schools, and he brought scholars, and on and on and on. It's a long letter. This is very nice. However, there are some problems, because if his great-great-great-great-great-grandfather converted, this means that he was king of Khazars before there was a Khazar kingdom, because the Khazar kingdom only existed about 200 years. It is very difficult to be king before there is a kingdom. Usually, you have a kingdom, then you have a king. This is very difficult. Secondly, the geography in the letter is very problematic. There are many details about the geography of the Khazar kingdom in the area of the Crimea. But the Khazar kingdom had very important relations with the east. And when the, in the letter, the geography of the east is not accurate. It's very, very unclear, and it does not mention important cities in the east. Not only that, in the letter, the Khazar king describes the orchards the vineyards, the great agriculture of his kingdom. But he doesn't say anything about sheep and goats. And we know from other sources that the Khazars were wandering people in the great open areas near the Caspian Sea. They were not farmers, they were killers. They were so warriors who wandered on horses. So that the description of the economy is not similar to that of the Khazar lands. It is very similar to the agriculture of Spain. 
and there are, there are additional problems in the letter. The most, the greatest problem is that the Hebrew is too good. The Hebrew is perfect. Now, if you have somebody living in a far-off land speaking Turkish or a Turkish language, you should see some of that in the Hebrew that he writes. When Americans write Hebrew, you can see that they think in English. And when somebody who, write, who speaks German writes in Hebrew, you don't understand anything. That's clear proof that he thinks in German. Now, the Hebrew is too good. It's like when I read a paper of a student in Israel, if they start writing with words in Latin, then I know that they are copying from Wikipedia. No student in Israel today uses Latin. It's too good. If you, you want somebody to believe you, you have to put mistakes in the text. Now, uh, this raises serious questions. And there might be some answers. The, one of the greatest works of Jewish mysticism is a book called the Zohar. Now, according to the Zohar itself, it was written in the time uh, just after the Second Temple by a great rabbi living in is what is now Israel. However, there are no references to the Zohar in the 3rd century, 4th century, 5th century. All of a sudden, we find the Zohar in Spain in the 12th century. And almost anybody studying the Kabbalah says that the Zohar was actually written in Spain. But the author wanted to people to take it seriously, so he said, this was written hundreds of years ago in the land of Israel. Therefore, you have to read it and study it. In Spain, there was a, a lot of creativity when it came to documents. Jews did it. Christians did it, Muslims did it. It was a literary genre. So when you see a letter from the king of the Khazars that is written in beautiful Hebrew, but does not reflect the reality of the Khazar world, you have to be suspicious. There are other sources. There is a letter that was found, also in pretty good Hebrew, which describes this, the origin of the Khazars. The Khazars really were Jews from Armenia who came to the land of Khazars and assimilated. But there was a great general and his wife, decided that she wanted to go back to her roots and she made her husband, the general, observe the Jewish Sabbath. And this made the king of Greece and the king of Arabia angry and they had a religious argument. And then somebody went into a cave and found the Torah, and they began to read the Torah. How they learned Hebrew in one night, it does not say, 
But if they would teach us how to learn a language in one night, then I would speak to you in Polish tomorrow. But the story is amazing. And the story is impossible. This is a story from the 1001 Nights, the stories of fantasies, wonderful stories, but not a historical reality. Now, before I go to additional stories, I have to mention what are the sources that we do not have. Now, many historians work with sources that we have. It is only a historian like myself who can work with sources that we do not have. But let us say that Khazars converted to Judaism. This should have been very interesting for the king of, or the emperor of Byzantium. Byzantium was very close to the Khazars lands. There were many relations. Very often they were allies in war. There were and in Byzantium, much was written about the Khazars. Now, if the Khazars were Jewish, it is very difficult to imagine that a Christian empire like Byzantium would not be interested in this fact. Not a word. Even when the patriarch in Constantinople sent missionaries to the Khazars with instructions how to convert them, he didn't say anything about the fact that they are going to convert the Jews. This is quite strange. Something should have been said. We have a great deal of literature from the Jews in Iraq or Babylonia. If there were scholars in the Khazar lands, this was very close. There should have been letters, books, correspondence, nothing. Not only that, there is no reference. And now, most important of all, the uh, leaders of the communities in Babylonia collected money from a wide area in order to support the Jewish schools in Babylonia. And we have records of fundraisers who were sent out to collect money, and they go to all kinds of places, but they don't go to the Khazar lands. You have a king, the only Jewish king in the world, and he's rich, and nobody sends a messenger to collect money there? Very strange. If one looks at the literature of Maimonides, who lived just after the time of the Khazars, Maimonides says nothing about the Khazars. And if you look at the literature from Georgia, from Armenia, nobody mentions it. These are strange things. There are many graffiti that were found in the Khazar lands, but no graffiti with Jewish symbols. Not only that, the burial customs of the Khazars were usually cremation, burning bodies. 
which is against Jewish tradition. But the Khazars apparently continued all of the time to cremate and did not adopt Jewish traditions. So we have no material sources which have Jewish symbols. There are later, or there are in Crimea where there were old Jewish communities, but nothing that's tied to the Khazars, and no references in Byzantium, in Babylonia, in Egypt, everywhere where one would expect it. However, there were references in Muslim literature. Now, as recall, the, uh, in the Arabs, for very good reason, hated the Khazars, and they described the fact that the Khazars converted to Judaism. The question is, what, were, what is the basis? Perhaps other literatures did not mention it, but the conversion did take place. The oldest source that we have is an author by the name of Ibn Rusta, and he describes the Khazars. He says their capital is a city which has never been heard of. He is the only person to mention. And he says, what was the name of the Khazar king? And I will say the name, and I will see who here knows Hebrew. According to Ibn Rusta, the name of the Khazar king was Isha. Isha in Hebrew means woman or lady. Now, this is a very odd name for a Jewish king, lady. Maybe Ibn Rusta asked a Jew for the information and the Jew played a joke on Ibn Rusta. That could be. But the source is problematic. Many people have used this source as evidence for the fact that the king of the Khazars was Jewish. Yes? Yeah, this is the uh, there there. This is the conclusion that people have drawn, because the evidence doesn't make sense. According to the same sources, most of the population was Muslim, and the king was Jewish, which is very very bizarre. Why would a Muslim population want to have? even a Jewish vizier. The, the sources uh, don't fit. Now, I have experience with studying Talmud. In Talmud, you can take, everything can make sense. You can fit it all in. The, what you never say in Talmud is that a fact is wrong. But reading these sources carefully, there are pro there, the problems are with facts. Since my time is limited, I want to finish, but after I finish, I'll be happy to discuss this. Ibn Rusta, if people would read all of Ibn Rusta, I didn't, but I read the good parts. Ibn Rusta writes that he, know, he lives in Persia, and he knows about Persia. What he says is that what I write about other places is not always so accurate. And one has to accept the fact that what he writes might be not so accurate. Other sources 
uh, which are, seem independent from Ibn Rusta, also describe conversion. But one of the most important, who is Al-Masudi, also describes the fact that uh, there was a mass migration of Jews to the Khazar lands from Byzantium because of persecution there. The problem is that except for al-Mas'udi, we have no evidence for persecution. If we look in the history books, everybody says there was persecution. But who is the source? It's always the same one person. We do not have sources in Byzantium, despite the rich literature that exists for persecution at the time that he described. Now, the most critical problem is the dates. Each author offers a different date for the conversion. And if we take the evidence that we have from missionaries who came and said nothing about Judaism, many of the dates contradict each other because they are before the missionaries came. And in general, contradictory dates raise a problem. The third and last source that I will describe is a very interesting coin that was found. It is a counterfeit, a false dirham. A dirham is an Islamic coin, and it was made in Khazaria. On the coin, it says, in Arabic letters, there is no God but God, this is the Shahada, the Islamic theology, and his prophet is Moses. Now this could only have been made by a Jew. The question is, was this evidence that the king converted to Islam? Here, the problem is precisely the coin. This, every year, the Khazars made counterfeit dirhams. That's it's a whole story, I can't discuss it now. But they made it every year. If the Khazar king converted to Judaism, he should have made this coin every year. And that would have been very, very interesting. But if it's just one year, then it's very possible that it wasn't the king who made the coin, but the person in the factory where they made coins. This was a very common Jewish occupation. Even in Iraq, Jews worked as coin makers, as minters. And it is possible that the king hired a Jew to make coins in Khazaria, and the Jew put in a new version of the Shahada. The, however, whether this happened or the, another, another reason happened, one coin is not enough. It shows all the more that this is not part of a systematic ideology. What then are we left with? If we have sources that are very, very problematic because they contradict each other, they do not fit in with the knowledge that we have, and they are part of a semi-fantastic description of the Orient, almost all these coins, all sources, sorry, 
almost all these sources say that the Khazars live near the land of Gog and Magog. These were two nations mentioned in Jewish tradition and in the Quran, two nations that lived far away and were very, very dangerous. In the Quran, they are seen as nations that could possibly destroy the world. Now, this is a mythical element, and the minute you find the Khazars mentioned in the context of Gog and Magog, one can see that this is very possibly part of a mythical element. So when a story does not make sense, when there is no material evidence, when the Jews themselves, except for two letters which appear counterfeit, when the Jews do not mention it, the Byzantines do not mention it, the Georgians and Armenians, then it seems very difficult to say that there ever was a conversion to Judaism. It seems very simple that this is one more story, a fascinating story, an interesting story, but not a historical story. But what about all the Jews of Poland? Well, these things happen. If you go to South Africa today, you can find about three million people in South Africa who speak Afrikaans. The settlers of South, the white settlers who came from the Netherlands. How many people went from the Netherlands to South Africa? 2,000. From 2,000 settlers, we have today 3 million Afrikaners. If you go to Quebec in Canada, what is the language of Quebec? French. How many people went from France to Quebec? About 5,000. That's all. Boats were small. The ocean was big. 5,000 went. They had babies, and they had babies, and they had babies. Today, there are more than 6 million speakers of French in Quebec. How do populations grow like debt? If you borrow money from the bank and you don't pay, the debt grows and grows. Why? You pay interest on the interest on the interest. Ask in Greece, they can tell you. The debt grows very, very quickly. Populations grow very, very quickly. Poland was a very good place to live. The, whoever, the Jews that came were a few thousand, but under good conditions, like the Afrikaners, like the population of Quebec, the population grew. So it's exciting to think about romantic stories of conversion to Judaism, of a population that fled from the East and found refuge in Poland. But A, the Jews in Poland have nothing to do with the Khazars. No, but not by genetics, not by language, not by any evidence. And the Khazars themselves lived and died as honorable Khazars, believing in their gods and in their religion. They didn't need Judaism. But we have some very interesting stories. And that can remain. Thank you very much for your attention. When did this theory arise, and why was it so attractive? Well, it wasn't a theory. It was a story. Nobody likes theories. 
Nobody reads Marx for fun. But stories are very nice. We enjoy stories. The Arabs hated the Khazars. They were cruel people. They were violent people. They also didn't like the Jews, so they called the Khazars dirty Jews. And as a result, this was one more insult, and it's not difficult to see how the story developed. We have, so there's a whole literature about a medieval Jewish poet in Germany who wrote beautiful poetry, but why would a Jew write poems in German? Well, what happened? He has a poem where he says, I am a wandering Jew going from town to town. Now, he was not a Jew. He was a poet. And a poet can write, I am a wandering Jew. He can also write, I am a sad bird crying in the night. That doesn't mean that he has wings. It means that he is a poet. So that for the popular Arabs who hated the Muslim, who hated the Khazars and didn't like the Jews, this was one more epithet, and then it had to be explained. Wait, how are they Jewish? And then the story, this is a speculation, but the story developed. If they were not born Jews, they must have converted. How did they convert? The Jews loved this story. The Jews liked the idea that a nation that would compare Judaism to the other religions would pick Judaism as the best religion. Now, we have a similar story among the Rus, who had to pick a religion. And they also have a story that the uh, Tsar, or the leader, of the Knyaz, gathered representatives of different religions, and the Muslim presented Islam, and then they asked the key question. If we are Muslims, can we drink? And the Muslims said no. So the Knyaz said no, we're not, going to be, uh, we're not going to be Muslims. Then he asked the Jews, well, if your religion is true, why are you so poor? Now, if the Khazars had converted to Judaism, this would have been a good place to say something. So the Jews started a whole discussion because of our sins and the temple, and the Knyaz said, quiet, we'll go with the Christians. So that you have these imaginary stories, but they're very interesting stories of how one picks a religion. But that's not how things really happen. Yes? Oh. Mm. I may need some translation help. So. Po pierwsze, chciałem panu profesorowi podziękować za notę optymizmu, bo przy zadłużeniu Polski to, co pan powiedział o rozmnażaniu się długu, a jeżeli odwrócimy, to Polska będzie mocarstwem światowym dorównującym Chinom w populacji. Panie profesorze, pominięty został wątek Karaimów. Gdy pan był uprzejmy podjąć ten wątek, będę wdzięczny. I dodatkowe dwa pytania. Spotkałem Żydów na Kaukazie, wyjątkowo piękne kobiety, a równocześnie Żydów w Uzbekistanie. Czy może być coś takiego, że Żydzi w Uzbekistanie trafili za pośrednictwem Hazarów? Dziękuję. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, with regard to the Karaites, it is much simpler because Karaites do not accept converts. So the story is, it, wouldn't, it doesn't fit the Jews, it doesn't fit the Karaites. Also, the people who wrote about the story knew the difference between Rabbinite Jews and Karaite Jews, and they never mentioned that this was Karaites. They always said Rabbinite Jews. With regards to the Jews of, uh, of Uzbekistan or of other, uh, of the Kavkaz in general, again, to say it's impossible, I, it's very difficult. But there is no evidence for their descent from the uh, from the Khazars, and as far as I know, the genetic evidence links them to other historical Jewish populations, and not to, as a Turkic population, which would be uh, very separate. Uh, the Georgian Jews, for example, in the Kafkaz have no evidence of Turkish in their, in their speech, in their language, in their names. So the same problems come up there as well. So it doesn't seem. There, there were attempts to explain that the Chuvash, which are a Turkic-speaking people, were descendants of the Khazars who became Islamicized, and somebody made efforts to find Hebrew in the language of the Chuvash, but it's very, very artificial. It's, uh, it, it's not convincing. Uh, and again, that doesn't answer all of the other problems which I raised about the conversion. Uh, the Karaites, I mentioned the Karaites do not accept converts. So there's, be, there's nothing to talk about the Khazars converting. Okay, but how did they got, uh, they are not Jews. How did they got? The Karaites are Jews. Are Jews? Yeah. Let me explain who Karaites are. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, uh, this Maybe you want to invite me back and I'll give another lecture on the Karaites. You will. <laughs> uh, the, the Karaites are a group who accept the Bible but don't accept the Talmud. And this group started among the Jew, maybe started among the Jews of Iraq and they maintained an identity until today. But it was, it was started in the Jewish community, and they remained separate all of the, until now. So this is also about 1,400 years. It's a long time. No, uh, but no, less than 1,400 years. But the, the Karaites, the Karaites are Jews. They don't like to talk about that, but I can understand. Yeah. Uh, may I ask you a question? This is a bit personal, but I would like to know, is it, is it possible that some Khazars, Khazars, they came in the first wave of Tatarians who invade Poland in very early uh, age of 12th, 14th century? The question is, because my grand-grandfather had the name Hazarin, and the family story says that he was one of these Tatarian coming to Poland, and he was probably, probably somehow arrested and settled in Poland. Is it possible, you think? Yeah, everything is, uh, not, almost everything is possible. We don't have any evidence of Jewish Khazars after the year 1000. And after they were defeated and most of the warriors were killed, it's very difficult to imagine how they could have maintained any kind of Jewish life 
or identity. For that matter, they never were Jews before then. But I'm saying even if I'm absolutely wrong, this, this is not so likely. I'm not going to say no. How do I know? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, but I can say that if that is the case, my advice is to stay in Poland and not go back to the homeland. You're, be you're better off here. <laughs> uh, uh, well, who's, yeah, okay. I have an impression when I listen to your uh, lecture, which is really interesting, that uh, there is nothing that we know about Khazars whatsoever. Everything is like assumptions about their ethnicity, religion, lifestyle. You assume that they are Turks, and you assume their religion was Islam, and you assume they were shepherds. And uh, have you come across the works of Russian scholars like Artamonov or Gumilov? Their stance is completely different. They claim that the ethnicity was mixed. They were indigenous people who were actually mixed with uh, Turks, mi mixed, uh, mixed with other ethnicities that, that uh, crossed this area because this area was crossed by tribesmen. And the religion was uh, Christian. And the other thing is about the lifestyle. What was char characteristic to, uh, about the lifestyle of Hazars was that they were linked to the river. That's why the Itil and their uh, capital was actually on the river and they were gardeners and kept the vineyards. Of course, they were robbers as well, but they were es especially, it was fishermen and the people who cultivated land. And it's, it's nothing about shepherding. And another um, thing is mm -hmm. that the Mazdakite would be, what you say, the would be migration after the Mazdakite revolt that entered um, the Caucasian area and the would be Khazaria, they were actually shepherds. And that's why perhaps they were illiterate. That's the supposition of the Russian scholars. And they didn't leave the material, the reference, which you were referring to in the absence of which is, according to you, the exa exactly the proof for the non-existence of the Judaic, uh, Judeo-Hazarian Kaganate. Uh, basically, most of, what you most of what you said is correct. I, mean, I, was, I hope I was careful to say it seems that they were Turkic. We don't know. Gumilev, I don't think, is a serious scholar. Artamanov was. Although Artamanov didn't write what he thought because he was scared stiff of Stalin and he was quite right. His work was banned. I know. But even the second, rev there are two editions, but the second edition he was also, he was scared. So it's difficult to know exactly what Artamanov thought. But that was, a, that was the, the nature of the times. But, so I don't want to say, if I said too much about the Khazars, then I was wrong. It's, we know very little. And there, most of what they wrote is also speculation. What is difficult to say is if they were farmers and fishermen, it's hard to understand how they were such a powerful army that could defeat the Arabs. This, this implies some system of organization that... They were this author claims they were not traders and these armies were just uh, the people who were hired people, like Kachinakes uh, and uh, Yeah, but, but, the, but the Arabs didn't say that. The, the Arab writers write about the Khazars and, and they distinguish between the Khazars and the Alans and the Pechenegs and the other troops. Now, it could be. I mean, that's, that's not my field. Uh, it's too, for me, it's too much speculation in general. My only concern is that 
the evidence for conversion is very, very problematic. And since there were so many fantastic stories in general at the time, the simplest understanding of the references that do exist is to say that this is one more fantastic story. Uh, I have to admit my sins. I wrote a long, long article on the topic with many, many footnotes. If anybody wants to read through it, I'd be happy to provide a link to it. But the main thing is we, we know very little. And it's, okay, and the, it's very odd if, to say that we know almost nothing about the Khazars, but we do know they were Jews. That's, that's atypical. Yeah. P pardon? It applies to the Jews. Yeah. And is it possible that the Jewish communities in the East and West broke the relations so the one didn't write about the other for some religious or other concerns and didn't mention their existence? It's possible, but very, very unlikely. It's usually people are proud. For the Jews, to say that somebody converted would be wonderful. It shows that their religion is attractive. It's a very strong for the self-image. So that uh, it's, it, it's not so likely, and that would not explain why in Byzantium there is no reference to it. Why don't the Byzantines and all of their literature mention the fact that the Khazars were Jewish? There's too much literature there to understand why they skipped this point, which for a Christian country would have been very important. So it doesn't make sense. They were killed. They were overpowered. Many tribes disappeared. It was tribes appeared and disappeared and reorganized. Yeah. Yes. Elan uh, El Haik, on whose uh, paper uh, you delivered such a convincing comment, has one more very intriguing thing to say about the population growth, which is one of the essential points in, in your lecture. Uh, if I may quote, a major difficulty with Weinlein hypothesis, the Weinlein as opposed to Hazarik, uh, is to explain a vast population expansion of Eastern European Jewry, uh, Jews from 50,000 in 15th century to 8 million in 20th century. The annual growth rate that accounts for this population expansion was estimated at almost 2% two, uh, two, two in order of magnitude. No, 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 not 2%, two, 2 per mil. Yeah. Uh, may, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. It says percent. And percent, I count that's it. very high, okay. It does, it does, and I didn't count it myself, of yeah. course. Uh, but the numbers, uh, do relate to your numbers, uh, but the circumstances uh, do not. If I may uh, take one more question, uh, one more, one more sentence uh, of this elaboration: one order of magnitude larger than that of Eastern European non-Jews in the 15th to 17th centuries uh, prior to the Industrial Revolution. This growth growth could not possibly be the product of natural population expansion, particularly when subjected to severe uh, uh, economic restrictions, slavery, assimilation, the Black Death, and other plagues, uh, and other plagues forced and voluntarily conversions, persecutions, kidnapping, rapes, exiles, wars, massacres, and pogroms. Because such an unnatural growth rate over half a millennium and affecting only Jews residing in Eastern Europe, it is implausible, it is explained by a miracle, and so on and so on. So uh, uh, 
it has to be uh, noted here that your examples with South Africa and your examples with Quebec uh, pertain to quite a different context. They, they, okay, yes, please. Uh, he's wrong. Uh, he's, he's wrong, and I have to say that this is personal, that I dislike some of the things he said. Some are just mistakes. There was the Black Death did not come to Eastern Europe. The rat, the Black Death, came on fleas that grew on brown rats. And the Black Death came up from Italy through what is now Germany. It stopped in the Czech lands. It didn't really hit Bohemia and Moravia, and it certainly did not come to Poland, which is nice. That's a fact that's a mistake. There's also assimilation was not very common in the Polish lands. It existed, but it was not so common until the uh, more recent history. Those are errors. What I do not like is the description of the condition of the Jews in Poland as persecutions, kidnappings, killings. It's not true. There were incidents in Poland of violence, but they were exceptional. Basically, for Jews, Poland was a country with a rule of law, with clear rights and limitations, but it was not a country of random violence. And sometimes people take cases and they change a case into a part of everyday reality. That was not the case. it was not true for Poland. Now, the comparison that he makes with the general population of Poland is uh, very, very problematic. Here you just have to think a little bit about Poland to understand. What was the occupation of 90% of the Polish population? Peasants. Agriculture. Now, the death rate, the child mortality among Polish peasantry was very, very high. Now, this is another lecture, but I'll just mention it in passing. How in a peasant family do you feed a, an infant if the mother is working in the field? How, does a, how do you feed an infant? You take a bowl of milk or of some kind of uh, kasha, you put a rag in the food, and then you put it in the baby's mouth. What does the baby get? It gets the food, and it also gets all of the bacteria that are in the house. Therefore, the mortality of babies was sometimes close to 50% in the first 10 years. It was terrible, terrible. Among Jews, Jews did all kinds of, had all kinds of occupations except for agriculture. And Jewish women could breastfeed much longer than a peasant mother because they didn't have to go out into the field. So that the, here's the funny part, the birth rate among Jews was probably lower than the general population. Why? A mother that breastfeeds doesn't have 
many babies. But the babies that she does have survive. So that it is not possible to compare people who work in agriculture with a population that is involved in trade and in crafts. It's just not reasonable to compare. Therefore, it is quite possible that the Jewish population grew in the simple way by numbers. And what if they came because of the Khazars, we have a few minor problems, like how do you get from the Black Sea to Poland? It's a long trip, and it's not a very comfortable trip. It's, it's too complicated. Life is simpler. People have babies, they grow up, they're more. Uh, this is pr probably uh, the, the topic for the next uh, uh, lecture. Uh, Professor um, Stampfer is also a demographer who wrote uh, books and articles about the demography uh, of Polish Jewry and maybe, uh, as I see th this big interest, maybe we, we can organize another lecture about this. So uh, this means... Th So I will leave my toothbrush in your office oh, for okay. next time. Yeah, okay. I don't, yeah. <laughs> don't have to take it back with me. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, your uh, lecture and thank, thank you also for a uh, very interesting uh, discussion after that. Thank you. Thank you.